Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. And today I'm very happy to have Nick Shaw on the podcast. I think a lot of our guests will be aware of who Nick Shaw is. Uh, but if you're not, then you will be aware of the company that he co-founded, Renaissance Periodization, because Mike is one of the people we have most on this show. Uh, so people are very well aware of Mike Isretel and Renaissance Periodization. Well, Nick was a co-founder, so a really pivotal part he plays in that company and how successful successful it's been and that's part and why he's on the show and something we're going to be talking about he's also a former competitive powerlifter and bodybuilder he's also coached numerous athletes to world-class stages which is great um, and then also has a BA in sport management from the University of Michigan and uh, I kind of want to dig into Nick's background a little bit where how he even got to where he is today because we're going to be talking about something that's Nick's been working on I guess well years really but I guess really the last months has probably come into practice I guess but because it, it's all culminating and everything you've read and your experiences into what's going to be a really really cool book called Fit for Success so Nick if you want to give I don't know start from what even got you what, how did you get to where you are right now uh, maybe not from birth but maybe some of your education and everything from that kind of level <laughs> Uh, first, thanks for having me on, man. Uh, I know you have Mike on all the time, so this probably won't be as uh, there won't be as many swear words, <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not quite so many food uh, analogies or whatever. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I met Mike. So I, I was big into sports in high school. I knew that I wanted to go into college for something kind of sports related, fitness related. I didn't really know exactly what. Uh, went to University of Michigan in my sophomore year. My buddy and I were down training at uh, you know, basically our, our school gym. And in there was this, this little short dude, you know, five, six, probably like 215, two, two, you know, who knows? I don't even remember how big he was at the time. Maybe, maybe he was actually like 200. I don't remember. But he was squatting 405, four plates aside, just ass to grass, like perfect form. My buddy and I, like, we thought we had pretty decent form and stuff. We used to look at each other. We're like, what? what's going on? You don't see that in a university gym. You, you, that doesn't happen. And, you know, lo and behold, it was Mike and whatever. We didn't start chatting with him right away. We were just like, all right, like, respect to that guy. And so I was, lift, you know, we were lifting. We were, like, decently strong. And you know how it is. Like, when there's other decently strong people around, they're kind of doing things the right way. You just – kind of have that little connection for the most part and so we started chatting long story short he's like hey you're pretty strong why don't you join our powerlifting club and again i'm used to competing in sports growing up so i'm like hey that sounds great like i would love i don't have anything that i'm competing for now so you know he convinced me started i loved it did my first ever powerlifting I, I, actually i swear to god i think that's the only one i've ever done <laughs> i competed i competed 181 pounds um whatever. It was a long time ago. It was 2008, I want to say. So a real long time ago. Um, but anyways, it got me hooked. Like I knew that was kind of my calling after that. I was like, oh, I love this stuff. I love fitness. I love all about it. So Mike kind of took me under his wings and he's like, Hey, let's, let's put some weight on you. Let's get stronger. So he really started writing my diet and training programs early on uh, a real quick side story there. I was trying to gain weight and I was like, Hey man, I'm having a hard time. And he's like, here's what you're going to do. I was eating at the, you know, I, I had like the university uh, lunch cards or whatever. I, I lived in the dorms at the time. And he's like, all right, anytime you go in, you're going to start with soft serve ice cream. That is going to be the foundation of your meals. And he's like, then you eat on top of that, whatever you can. And I was like, huh? Okay. So anyways, I ended up gaining a bunch of weight, but again, it just, it got me hooked. Um, I knew that I wanted to be into competitive lifting after that because I loved it. So I just started training a lot. Again, yeah, long story short, I ended up competing in first bodybuilding show 2009. Actually, no, the power of me is 2007, 2008, was my first bodybuilding show. So Mike coached me all the way through it. And I was the first person he had ever coached all the way up to an actual show. So again, we learned a lot. It yeah. was really funny looking back. I looked better the day before the competition than the day of because we blew the uh, you know the carb loading and all that because we didn't really know. Uh, this happened, right? You kind of live and learn, and you know, thank, thank, thankfully, you know, no one was paying us at the time. It was all free, and this was 
you know, three, four years before RP even became something. So we learned a lot early on, made a lot of mistakes, of course. And I mean, that's a big part of it. You got to learn as you go and pick up little things here and there. So anyways, I ended up graduating. Mike was two years ahead of me in school. So he had just finished his master's degree and he's like, Hey, I'm moving to New York city. I'm going to be a personal trainer. He's like, you should come out here. You should interview. I had never been to New York city. I'm from like small town, rural Michigan. He's like, come out, just interview. I did got to move. We both lived in New York city for a year as personal trainers before he went back to get his PhD. So that's kind of officially how we got really started in personal training and all that. And then he went back to his PhD and that's kind of when RP, I guess, officially started not too long after. It's really cool. And I think everyone can relate to like seeing, even now, I mean, seeing someone squat that way with the form that Mike has, you still don't really see it. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that in my, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone do that in any of my training. Um, actually, maybe I have, but very rarely. And it's normally like powerlifters and you know what they're going for. Um, so yeah, and it, I think everyone can relate to like that little kind of nod or connection you get with people. So uh, it's really cool sure. to hear kind of how you met and where that first kind of passion came from and getting into the sport initially. And now it's like your full-time business. So wh- when did, uh, kind of renaissance who came up with the name actually where did the name renaissance periodization come from i bet that's got a story yeah so kind of a two-parter so mike was uh, coaching a lot of people online when he was at etsu getting his phd and i was still training people in person we were referring people back and forth so often that and again this was still pretty early this is probably let's call it 2011 something like that and he was like dude let's just start something up. Let's just like start a little company. Cause I had like Shaw fitness actually, because I was training people and like, that's just the little business that I had. And I was like, okay, well, I already have this. I'm like, let's just do that. And, and you know, so we're like, all right, well, what are we going to do with the name? And so Renaissance rebirth. So I always wanted to be very evidence-based of course. So that's where Renaissance came from. That's one part of it. Uh, periodization, hopefully self-explanatory for the folks listening to this podcast. I don't need to probably explain that a whole lot. Uh, the other really cool thing too, so there's a hedge fund in uh, Long Island in New York here in the States. It's called Renaissance Technologies. And sort of instead of hiring, I guess, day traders and, and stockbrokers and things like that, they basically have a formula of how the market works. And we were like, that is a really cool idea. Like, that's kind of what we want. We want a formula on kind of like how fitness works. So that's kind of the second part of Renaissance. Mm-hmm. And by the way, Renaissance Technologies, they like outperform the market every single year, basically. Like they crush it. Um, it's really exclusive, like hard to get into. You, know, you got to be very, very wealthy to get in there. So that was kind of the other maybe uh, motivation, it's inspiration, I should say, for, for the name. So that's yeah. kind of, that's it. And has there been for Renaissance periodization, because I think, a lot of people see it as like, I don't know, maybe they look at you and you're like, oh man, you were just like an overnight success or something. But like, we're getting to the roots here and we're seeing kind of all the kind of the lower half of the iceberg and where people are just seeing the peak now. But was there ever a turning point for you? Because now I don't know how many PhDs you have with the company or and how many, how many clients you're coaching, let alone all the app users now that you have. But you seem to always be kind of on the next like thing that's emerging so to even have an app uh, a, such a successful fitness app that's like one of the the peak things right now so yeah was there ever a turning point or has it always been just a, a slow burn and is there anything you attribute the success to the company like is there anything that you think you've maybe done differently to other people that's allowed it to grow how it has yeah all right so there's a lot a lot of a lot of stuff there i could probably touch on so we when again it goes back to we were so passionate about fitness like we just got started we just wanted to help people with diet and training programs and that's it and we started writing programs for close friends and family that, that was it this is 2012 i mean honestly it was like i, I jokingly said this uh, not too long ago I, I don't even know if instagram existed then so that, that was really maybe just like, <laughs> i'm not just sure was the beginning. Yeah. so again like we're talking you know eight years ago or something now so it's, it, it's been a while so yeah, maybe we were a little bit at the forefront of social media because we kind of got on at the right time, perhaps like there's something to be said for that, you know, and there's something to be said of, I don't know if you call it luck or whatever. I don't know if that's maybe the right word. Um, so again, maybe that plays a small role in it, but also we just knew that the foundation, we wanted to be evidence-based. We wanted to do things the right way. Also, we just want to make sure we treated people right. 
So we're going to do a good job with our clients. That's first and foremost, make sure we have like a good product that works. Now it may not have always looked the greatest. You know, if you go back to Renaissance Diet 1.0, the ebook and our first ever diet templates like way back in uh, February, 2015, they didn't look very nice. But again, we, you know, still kind of new to the scene and we're testing the market to see if people even wanted something like that. And turns out they did but they didn't look great, but they worked. The foundation of it, it worked. It would get people results. And that was really the two things. Treat people well, have good customer service, make sure that we have a good product that works. And we did those two things and the rest kind of took care of itself. Now there were some other things, maybe a little bit of luck in the timing, being kind of on the forefront of social media, we were able to get, you know, start working with a handful of athletes and influencers and kind of snowballed from there a little bit. But at the foundation of it, you still have to have those two main things. Treat people well, Boy, that one seems like a lost art sometimes when you talk to other coaches and you hear stories and you're just like, yeah. People don't even respond to emails, you know, they'll take your money and then they don't respond for a week. So we just never wanted anything to do with that because it's just, um, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, it's just not a long term approach. Yeah, you want to make some money in the short term. Okay, well, you know, don't treat people all that well and you'll get paid up front or whatever, but it's just not a long term strategy. And if you think long term versus short term, you start to make better decisions. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it's really evident in the way that Mike presents information and talks through things. And you can see that across the board with Renaissance periodization. And I don't know if it's something uh, my business partner always says is uh, you can only sell shit once. Um, like once you've sold it, like no one's going to come back for any more. So yeah, like yep. you said, it's it's pivotal, especially in like essentially a lot of what we're doing is kind of that personal training approach. They're buying into a brand because they trust that brand and that sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, to know and yeah, you see a lot of people come into fitness and they come and go, especially like influencers and things like this. So <laughs> you've got obviously complete staying power and you've just been able to keep going. And uh, like you, yeah, you said, you can have a short-term kind of win if you do go down a kind of bit of a fishy route or you become dogmatic and you become really kind of like, you know, it's sexy if you're really extreme, but you've always kind of stood to your kind of principles of evidence-based practice and things like that, which is really cool. And I guess as far as I'm concerned as a consumer, for me, it was the uh, scientific principles of strength training was the first ebook I think I read from you guys. And for me, it was just like, actually, the, the, the thing that kind of made me love RP at that point was like, this is saying things that I've heard, but never such in a really well written way. And it was just mm -hmm. kind of like, oof, I need to learn more from these guys. And that's when we then kind of looked to bring Mike over. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been amazing to follow the journey ever since that as well. So yeah, it's cool to see how you've come from like the RP diet, the first one and the templates and now into building the apps and everything. Uh, and the core foundation of that is like doing a good job, sticking by that and treating people with respect. And you can see that with the team that you've got as well. Like I would say the people that you seem to bring on, are all kind of it, it comes across at least as if they're kind of somewhat of like this they're friendly at least with each other and there's a community aspect and everyone wants to help the company and it's almost like the company is part of them i don't know if that's something you feel because a lot of people i guess they work for a company and they're like i couldn't care less about the company i'm just doing my job because i need the money yeah so that's actually stood out a lot lately um because we had like a new app release and um we we knew that there were going to be some issues there always is in software development but we had we ran into some issues with apple sort of delaying our releases and stuff that we wanted to get out immediately and it was really cool i've gotten a lot of feedback it kind of blows my mind almost that um everyone rallied together and everyone was doing their role. And it, there's, there's just a lot of trust and accountability. It was really cool to see and the feedback that we got from people that were involved in it was like, you don't see this too often. And, you know, it's just one of those things where I don't think there's any like secrets or magic to it. We just love what we do. We're very passionate about it. And again, like it goes back to, you know, we try to treat people that, that work for RP as well as possible because like what happens if you treat people poorly? Again, it's just not a long-term strategy. You're just, you're asking for failure at that point. You're just asking for bad things to happen. And so that's always just kind of been a, you know, a core principle. Like hopefully treat people well. You, if you treat people well, 
more than likely they're going to, to treat you well back. Now, again, there are exceptions to that rule, of course, but if, if someone doesn't recipro reciprocate that, well, then do you really want them around? Like, is that really someone that you want? Yeah. So I'm glad that you say that because again, hopefully, you know, if, if people are presenting, let's say they come over to London and they're presenting, well, hopefully they're not being so dogmatic. They're open to feedback. They sort of want some feedback. They want some dissenting opinion, like, hey, you know, we think these three things are the best, but, you know, someone else says, oh, yeah, but I also think these two are a little bit more important. Well, hopefully no one at RP is going to be like, no, that's dumb. Like, that's stupid. It's like, no, okay, well, like, let's hear you out. Okay, maybe you have some valid points because if you do, all right, well, maybe you know, we think one, two, three is more important, but hey, you know what? You actually have some good points. So maybe actually your top one maybe slides into like our number two or three spot, you know, something like that. There's gotta be a little bit of give and take along the way. Yeah, I think I think it definitely comes across. And I'd even say from what I can tell, your user base as well, almost kind of they're very much bought into the brand and you kind of, I guess, in business terms, people might call it like your tribe or whatever. And uh, I think you have it like the RP lifestyle might have been like a hashtag I've seen before. And that's, I mean, I guess in some ways like that, that's great for you guys because now you've got that customer base who are, if you release, like Mike's going to release his hypertrophy book. And I know like, I don't know, at least 50% of my audience listening to this is going to purchase that book because it's, they, they love the information he puts out and they've got a lot of trust there because you have that foundation that's built up all over the years that you put out quality stuff. Uh, is there ever, have you ever had any like major struggles as you've been building? Are there anything like, does anything spring to mind where you've been like, man, that's been super tough or uh, anything like that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Again, when we, when we start talking a little bit about the book, it, it's really funny. Like all of these things have parallels. And so everything we'll talk about later, like it all, it, it's all interrelated. And that was the thing that always stood out to me and kind of like what inspired me to end up kind of writing my book. Cause I started realizing all this stuff's interrelated there you're always going to fail okay you, no matter how successful you are there are always things that are going to mess up are always going to go wrong if you go in with the mindset sort of knowing that obviously you want to minimize it as much as you can you know you don't go in trying to fail of course but there's always stuff that's going to go wrong right you're releasing a new product you can plan for you know 10 different scenarios something's going to pop up that doesn't go right I've never spoken with anyone that's like, oh yeah, you know, I've never like messed up. That person doesn't exist, right? It's the same in fitness, right? Like you're gonna, whatever, fail on some lifts occasionally. Like that's just what, how it goes. So you have to go in with my, that mindset. Um, you know, off the top of my head, you know, one funny thing that stands out is like, we have these hunger diet templates. Uh, that might, I remember. These are, gonna be, these are gonna be the greatest thing in the world. I was a little more skeptical. I'm like, okay, well, maybe, okay, maybe they'll work. I just, no one liked them, no one liked them. No one, like, no, no one bought them. They, they, they were fine. I mean, they worked. But uh, again, so we go back to, we have an Understanding Healthy Eating book that we came out with in 2016. And we were like, this is it. Like, this is it. This is going to be like mainstream across everywhere in the world. Like, this is it. Like, this is so obvious. No one, like, not, no one, no one cared. No I, sent one cared. That, so I sent that to all my family because I was like, this is the book you need to read. <laughs> I, it's so funny, man. Like we thought, like we, we hired some like PR people because we're like, this is it. Like this is a book that people need to read. No, no one cared about it. So again, like there's just always a lot of stuff that you learn along the way. I mean, even just getting into software development, man, that's just a whole nother animal. And I've yet to speak to someone that doesn't re relay the same experiences in software development. They're like, yeah, it's just, uh, right. And I don't even know how to describe it. It is a whole nother world. And you just have to go in basically with that mindset of knowing like you can plan for all these contingencies, but there's always going to be some stuff that goes wrong. But this goes back to the whole mindset that you have to be open minded because if you're open minded, these things happen, you sort of you learn from them. Right. So you have two choices when you fail. You can either just quit or you can learn from it and keep going. Now, hopefully you, you look at those and you're like, OK, well, one option is probably a little bit better than the other. And if you take that route again, that's just. I don't know how we've always been like i've always kind of had the mindset of like i don't know like there's a lot of stuff i don't know and i think mike is even like this too you know he knows a lot of stuff of course but we're never shy to like let other experts come in and sort of do what they know how to do because boy there's so many things that i don't know and you know it's like some of that goes into ego a little bit you can't have too big of an ego like are there times of course where i would like to put my foot down and be no like i want to do this and then i kind of think like 
Well, I could be right, but there's probably a good chance that this other person's more likely to be right because, you know, they, they know it more than I do. So, yeah, there's just always failures along the way and you just got to grow and learn from it. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I, I think Pascal that's... here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. See you there. Yeah, I think a lot of people hopefully can resonate with that. And uh, into kind of you brought up the book there and to say the name again is like Fit for Success. And uh, I think it might be really cool to obviously people who are aware of kind of the, the other books you've done, you've kind of had your principles, you've had kind of the principle, uh, sorry, the pyramid, which kind of like ranks things in order of priority and what matters most. I don't know if initially kind of giving you an overview of that pyramid might be nice. And then obviously I've, I've been had the pleasure to read like the first couple of chapters. And I'd love to dig into a, a few of those, just give people a bit of a, a taste of what they're in store for. Yeah, sure. So I'll give a real quick backstory on kind of how this all got started. Um, a couple of years ago, I had hernia surgery and I couldn't train for a while. I couldn't weight train for a while. All I could do is walk. So I started walking. <laughs> I needed something to do. Uh, but I started listening to audiobooks, and I was not very good at sort of div diving into, you know, more education, more learning. And that just it like flipped this switch in my head. I was like, I don't know why I haven't been doing this all along. And I just, I kind of got addicted to that. Just started reading like anything and everything that I could, could get my hands on. So whether it's, it's business, it's uh, self-help, self-improvement, fitness, nutrition, psychology, uh, all that stuff, any and all of it philosophy, you know, whatever, you name it, I was probably reading it. And so I started noticing all these common trends that like, it wasn't just one area, right? And I started making some notes to myself, like, hey, this, this kind of, this idea seems like it actually popped up in a couple of different areas when, when people were talking about things. And so I had all these notes in my head. And then I started thinking about all the people that I'd work with, and some of our top athletes, and I started chatting with them a little bit about it. And it was really interesting to find all the parallels. So that was this initial, I guess, inspiration in my head. And then 2020 hit. And so again, just long story short, uh, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in January. She's fine now, knock on wood, she's doing really great. But, you know, had to go through treatment, surgery, chemo, radiation, all that stuff during quarantine, during coronavirus. And so it really made me take a step back and, and sort of I really had to change my mindset if I was going to come out of 2020 yeah. uh, in a good spot because there's just a lot going on, right? 2020 has been a hard year for so many people. So basically everyone in 2020 can relate to this. It's just been a rough year. And I, I again, I had to take that step back and be like, okay, well, I've been sort of thinking about all these various things that make people successful. And I really had to start applying them to my own life, even more so than I was. Because some of these things I was probably already doing a little bit of, but I wasn't really like aware of it that I was doing it. Does that make sense? You know, like in order to be successful, you probably do some things or whatever, but like it really forced me to concentrate and to kind of completely change my own approach and mindset to things. And so one morning I was just sitting there, I was reading a book. I don't remember what it was, but I was like, Wow, I have these ideas. I wonder if I could just write them down in this like pyramid image, just like RP Diet 2.0. And I did. And then I sent it to Mike and I sent it to a couple other people. I texted them. I'm like, hey, am I crazy? Like, what do you think of this? And people are like, no, I don't think you're crazy. Well, you might be crazy for other reasons, but like, hopefully, you know, this is probably on the right track. So I said, okay, like, this is cool. Like, I think I might have something here. And um, funny enough, so again, I'll talk about the, the, you know, each sort of the, the seven habits of success, if you want to call it. Yes. I didn't even have the, the lower tier, the very bottom one. I didn't even have that in my initial rough draft. And I showed it to Mike and he's like, he's like, I got a couple of tweaks. He's like, let me know what you think of this. And he said that I had overlooked work ethic. And I said, I don't think that's the case, Mike. Like, I don't think, no, no, I didn't overlook that. Like, I know that, but he's like, you're blinded by it because you, that's always been part of like who you are. You've just always been a hard worker. So you almost take it for granted. There's a lot of people out there that maybe need to, to see that. And I go, oh, okay, look, well, maybe that's the case. And he's kind of explained it. And, you know, it all makes sense. So now, like, work ethic. So, again, if you look at the nutrition pyramid, what's kind of the foundation of it, right? Well, you can make the argument it's adherence. Right. Right. So at the end of the day, in order to be successful in any endeavor, business, 
fitness, bodybuilding, overcoming adversity in life, right? Battling disease, whatever it is. And the foundation of it is work ethic. Because in order to be successful, you actually have to take, let's say you have an idea. You have to take that idea and you actually have to apply it and put it into practice, right? Ideas are just ideas. It actually takes work to create something. So that's why it literally forms the foundation of the pyramid because there's no way around it. You can't become successful without actually putting in the work to become successful. So again, we're talking to a more bodybuilding hypertrophy demographic here. Could you imagine if you only read evidence-based practices on hypertrophy? Well, you didn't lift, right? Like you no. have to go in and you have to put in the hard work. So I've heard Mike talk about this before, but sometimes the evidence-based folks maybe shy away from the hard work sometimes. And you have to sort of go, well, no, because you have like the hardcore bodybuilder meatheads on one side, they train hardcore, right? And then on the flip side, you have an evidence-based crowd. So again, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. You have to apply the hard work. It has to be there. Without it, you will not be successful. Like if you're a coder, you can code thousands of lines of programming, but if you don't do enough to complete the code that it actually creates something, you don't have anything. So again, that's kind of the, at the bottom of it, that is the most pivotal part of success, hard work. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people's ears will spring up, especially when you give the example of the evidence-based guys, like the PubMed warriors who they're trying to dig out the studies that can allow them to train less and less hard um, to do things, or just those who are spending more time in the books than they are practicing it. And like you said there, there's definitely something in the middle, as we know with evidence-based practice, like actually your own anecdote and your experience plays part of that. And yeah, it's the same with business. I'm, I'm sure so many people, and I'm sure I've had it where if it's just a great idea and you're like, you see someone else do it and you're like, oh, I thought of that a year ago. It's like, yeah, but you didn't actually do anything about it, did you? So uh, the, the kind of work ethic behind everything, it makes a lot of sense that that's kind of the driver for everything it's the it's really it's the key it is the key to everything <clears throat> and again it almost seems so obvious that maybe that's why i did overlook it originally mm. or like i maybe took it for granted but at the end of the day like you have to explain that to people right it would be like trying to explain nutrition without the adherence component and you can lay out all these things but if you're not adhering to your nutrition or your fitness program like you don't get anything out of it it's worthless so again that's kind of the best analogy there is, is work ethic. So that's number one. Uh, number two, it, it's interesting because I've talked about this idea before and some people have never heard the term internal locus of control. I hadn't heard of it. the term. I okay. hadn't, but when you, when I read through the chapter, I was like, oh, that's how I've kind of, kind of right. heard of it, but through a different terminology. Sure, sure, sure. Totally. So internal versus external locus of control, probably the simplest, easiest way to describe it. If you have an external locus of control, things happen to you. You don't really have much control over them. Internal locus of control. You know that your actions matter. The things that you do will help drive you in, in whichever way that you go. So uh, the analogy that I've used before, and it's actually in the book, uh, think back to like World War I or any war, really. If you are sitting back and you are getting shelled or bombed, you don't have any control over the outcome. That's an external locus of control. You're just kind of sitting there, you know, taking as much shelter as you can, but you're hoping for the best, right? You don't have really any control over the outcome. Whereas if you're, let's say, more on the offensive and you can sort of plan how you're going to attack or whatever, and, you know, maybe you divide or you flank or you do something, you have more control over the outcome. So that's one way to look at it. Um, it again, most people, they haven't heard that exact phrase, but when you start talking to them about, you know, something like stoicism, for example. Well, at the end of the day, that's kind of the same concepts, right? So no matter what happens to us, we have, as humans, we have the ability to think and choose how we want to respond to it. Like no matter what, okay, even if something horrible happens, we can choose how we respond to it. Now, again, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm perfect at it because we just had some stuff that happened recently. And I was like, I probably didn't respond as, as good as I should have. And I was because I've been so involved in, you know, so deep into this stuff for the last year plus, I thought that I would be very good at it. And then, you know, again, some of this stuff happened and I was like, wow, like I've, I've got a long ways to go. I have a lot to learn and improve upon because 
it's so easy to talk about this stuff in theory, but again, it's putting it into actual practice because there's always going to be stuff that happens. Again, you know, you take like personal stuff in my own life with my wife, you know, this year and all that stuff. Again, it's really hard and it's, it's so easy to go down the wrong road where you sort of, if you feel like a victim, you don't feel like you can do anything to impact your outcome. Boy, that's a real slippery slope and you can go down some real dark holes there. You know, if you don't think that you can do anything about it. And especially with something like, you know, cancer or whatever, boy, there's a lot of people when they're hit with that, that they do go down that road, right? Or with coronavirus, yeah. it would be far too easy to set back in your house and go, oh, woe is me. I just, I, there's nothing to do. I don't, I can't control this. That's one way to approach it. I don't think that's a very good way to approach it though. On the other hand, like I have two small kids. So we're having to homeschool our kids now. We, you know, we had to do it earlier this year, you know, trying to work from home. You know, my wife and I, she's going through all this stuff. And it's like, it's very, I very easily could have taken that victim mindset and then like, oh, woe is me. Oh, you should feel bad for me. I was like, no, that's not who I am. I'm never going to do that. That's not part of me. I'm never going to be a victim. No matter what happens to me, I'm always going to choose the route that I can take action to impact the outcome. And I will take that. So again, just as some examples, like you can have a more positive mindset, which ironically is number three if, if we move up the pyramid. But again, like you can just choose how you respond. You can choose to dwell on the negatives or you can choose to see the good in things. And if you do that, right, if you have a more grateful, more positive mindset, you're going to be much better off. Um, or again, like, you know, I, I taught my daughter how to read, right? She was in kindergarten and like she was struggling with it. Well, now she's being homeschooled, but I taught her how to read. You know, they know how to ride their bikes now. You know, it's like little things like that. Like you can choose to be real negative about everything that's happening, or you can, you know, grab the bull by the horn, so to speak, and you can make stuff happen. And I think, you know, that's what successful people do. They don't set back. They go ahead. They are, uh, they're proactive. They're not reactive. Yeah, I love that. I think it's, it's so important. And a lot of that is, is things I, the, the kind of phrase that I often end up using with clients is like control what you can control. Don't stress about exactly. the things outside of your control, which is a, like a similar sort of line to kind of the internal kind of uh, locus of control, which I think is great. And the COVID example and the examples you gave there are, are perfect, but exactly like with the lockdowns and everything now, especially with people's fitness goals, they're like, ah, oh, the gym's just shut. I can't do anything. It's like, no, let's look at what you can do from home or whatever it might be. Mm. Yep. And so many people are just very ready to give up. And I think, yeah, I mean, perfect in your situation is probably one of the, I mean, he had so many different excuses that you could have given into, but you decided to step above that because in the short term, that might be feel nice to be woe is me, but you look back in a month and you feel like, well, what have I done? Nothing. Whereas you can kind of do all these other things, which you have been doing, which is great. And some other things you touched on before was like uh, when you were talking about how Renaissance got where it is and you did mention like luck because obviously luck comes into things. And one thing you did talk about was kind of having too much control. I don't know if you want to touch on kind of being too controlling and uh, the kind of the problems that can bring. Yes, I think if you have too much control, you kind of get a little blinded. Uh, you can't see some of that outside feedback. And you have to, again, right, there's a dichotomy to everything. You can't go too far to the extremes one way or the other, right? And that applies to so many things in life. Uh, it would be like, uh, you know, you're like, oh, hey, three sets of 10 is good on squats. I'm going to do 10 by 10. And it's like, okay, no, back up. So again, if you, if you get too blinded by that, you can obviously go, go too far with things. So you have to be mindful of that. And that, again, it's a, a case with pretty much everything across the board. Um, but again, like, there are probably some external factors that play a role. Like, let's talk about luck. Let's talk about timing. So again, you know, you start reading all these different books and, you know, uh, I think it's uh, Malcolm Gladwell in Outliers. He talks about uh, uh, Bill Gates and some other tech guys. Well, boy, Bill Gates had like one of the only computers in the entire United States, like in his middle school. There's a little bit of luck involved to that, right? But at the same time, so luck plays a role. I'm not sure how big of a role, right? Because it's really hard. You start looking at that and it really becomes tough to break it down because, well, in business, there's so many different variables. What's luck and what's skill? Uh, boy, that one's a real tough one to really break down when, when you really start looking at all the different factors. Whereas if you have something you know, like chess with very set, rules and guidelines well it's a lot you're not really going to be luck when it comes to that like you're not going to luck your way to becoming a pro bodybuilder for example right 
Um, but again, luck does play a little bit of a role. Let's say, you know, are you lucky if you have genetics that maybe uh, let you not get injured as much, right? Maybe some someone has a, a tendon or something that's just not quite as good. Again, it plays a little bit of a role. But again, the more action you take, again, the more likely you are to uh, benefit from luck is the best way to describe it. I guess it's like, yeah, that I feel like I've heard this somewhere, like the the harder you work, the more luck you seem to have or something along those lines. It's like, well, you can only be so lucky. Uh, there's only a yeah. certain point, like you said, with the pro bodybuilder, like, yeah, I mean, you could be lucky with who turns up on the day, but to become a pro at that stage, like you have to have taken it to that point you have to have worked hard to even got to stage so uh, i think a lot could be said for that and uh, something i did want to touch on in the book uh you had like a practical tip at the end of each chapter which i think is really nice because i think sometimes you can come away from some of these books uh, and you're kind of like okay now where do i go from here uh, and at the end of that chap chapter you kind of talked about kind of keeping a journal a journal of your largest obstacles to overcome which i thought was just a nice thing that you had just at the end there so people can kind of read through that and be like, okay, how do I apply this? And you had that directly there. Yeah, totally. You know, write down things and be like, okay, well, did I have any control over it? If not, well, don't stress about it too much. If you were able to have some control over it, well, why aren't you taking those actions then? Like take those actions. And again, going back to the hard work thing, uh, something that's actually stood out to me, and this is totally kudos to Mike, because he's been doing this for a long time. I think he actually told me about it. I kind of blew it off. I was like, yeah, 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 sure, Mike. Man, you just make a daily to-do list. And if you stick to it, I'm telling you, I started doing this a month or two ago. I, I feel like I get so much more done by like 9 a.m. Because I just look at my list and I'm like, oh, I got to do this. 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 Now I have quite a few things on there, right? Like some of them are just part of my daily habits. I, I don't miss those things anymore. If you don't write it down, if you're not kind of checking it off as you go along, Boy, you know how it is. It's so easy to forget things, right? So let's say you need to take all of your supplements. Yeah. I mean, stuff happens. You can very easily forget to, you know, take your creatine or, you know, take your multivitamin in the morning, whatever it is. Like you can very easily forget that. You have a little to-do list, check it off. You're not going to miss it. I know so it's many so people, so many people miss their creatine. That's such a good example. And I'm just like, or, uh, yeah. I mean, you could get into a whole habit discussion here where you like combine habits and things, but it's like, I think you were talking about <laughs> Maybe it was off air, it was at the start, but it's like thinking through lots of stuff that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't realize are really productive towards your overall goals. It's not to you stand back. You're like, oh, I've got all these habitual great habits to make sure that I'm successful. But if I kind of look at them and I define them for people, now they can start applying those as well. So yeah, I think the to-do list is something, it's one of those small things no one wants to do, but it's recommended a lot of the time frequently for a good reason as well simple but not you know it's simple to do but it's just not easy right and this again like you just start looking back at everything as to what makes people successful and it's, it, the perfect analogy really is bodybuilding you don't become this huge hulking monster overnight you just do a little bit each day a little bit and it just keeps gradually building over time right and again let's say if you're a natural bodybuilder what do you put on per year three, four, five pounds of lean tissue. Lucky if you get that. <laughs> right. Again, but then you step back and you can say, okay, well, you do that for five, 10 years in a row. You go from the 170 pound guy to, you know, 190 or 195 like that. But again, it's the consistency for years upon years. So many people don't want to do that. And we're all guilty of it at times, of course. We don't want to put in the work over time. We want stuff now. Yeah. We want it now. Everyone does. Mike has good quotes, right? Where he's just like, do you think you're the first person that like has wanted overnight results or something? He's, I'm sure he's probably said it on the, the podcast before. You know what I'm talking about. But it's just like, dude, if you're that easy, shit, everyone would be successful. But it's yeah. not. No, absolutely. I always say uh, bodybuilding is like the epitome of delayed gratification because you look at the best bodybuilders, they're typically the oldest, but they're yeah. the ones who have, been working consistently over that time and not got injured um, and that sort of thing so i think uh, it's a, a great example i know that the next chapter was all about you talked about already kind of having that positive mindset which again yep. can be really tough but 
um you kind of one of the really cool uh kind of yeah i mean you brought up placebos and i'd love you to kind of just talk through because people relate to that on this kind of because they've probably heard about placebos but how that can even be such a dramatic thing yeah this is something i'm I'm starting to dive into more i've got uh you know i've got a at least at least one book because again like my wife ordered it around um you know, when she was diagnosed, like she's got a, a bunch of books and I haven't read it yet. But again, it's just like the power of mindset is really something. Now, I'm not saying placebo can, can cure anything or do these remarkable things, but it's a real thing. It is a very real thing. And it shows up in evidence-based practices. Like in order to prove that you have an effective drug, you have to beat the placebo effect. Because just believing that you, you know, think about a uh, real quick side story. If, if I go back to when I was like 15 or 16, the first time I took whey protein, the first time I took whey protein, I was drinking it on the way to school. So I was probably 16 because I was driving. Steve, I thought that I was Arnold because <laughs> I was taking whey protein. I, I had the best workout of my life because I was taking whey protein because I believed that I was the man. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be, this is going to change the world. Like I, I'm going to, I'm going to go have the best workout in the world. Guess what I did? I had a really great workout. So there is definitely some power to that. There, there is a lot to be said for just having the right mindset. So again, if, let's say you don't have great genetics and bodybuilding. So do you get discouraged? Do you maybe not train as hard? Okay, maybe. Okay, that's not a great mindset to have. But if you're more positive, you're more optimistic, you believe that, again, and kind of the, everything ties together, right? So if you believe you can impact your outcome and turn a locus of control, again, you're probably going to be more optimistic. You're going to be more hopeful that the things you do matter. Again, you do all this stuff. Well, what happens? It sort of creates this positive feedback loop. You end up taking more action. Again, you take more action, you start to get more success, it just kind of builds upon itself, this positive feedback loop, there you go. So again, positive mindset is just really important because what's the alternative? You know, if you're, if you're dealt cancer, what's the alternative? You're gonna sit in a corner and cry? That's an option. Mm. And it's, it's probably okay to do that for a little bit, but is it a long-term strategy? I hope not. Again, uh, the the, uh, the founder of its company in the U.S. is a nonprofit. It's called Barbells for Boobs. They, they do a lot of fundraising for breast cancer. And um, the founder of it said two things to me when I told her that my wife was diagnosed. I already knew her and we'd worked with her for a while. But she said, you have to control what you can control. If you can't control it, don't worry about it. Okay, check. Internal looks of control. That one's checked. And uh, number two is you have to be, you have to have a positive mindset about it. And I was like, okay, check. There we go. Positive mindset. I'm like, guess what? Successful people do all the same things. It's no coincidence that people are successful. It's because they do a lot of the same things. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's so true. And I thought one example you kind of used in the in the book was Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile, yes. which I thought was just like, when, when you get that example, it's like, that's cra- like, it's crazy because people don't believe something like that. He beat the four minute mile, which no one had. And then suddenly in that year, there was so many other people breaking it and it's because they could now believe they could. So it's almost like you want to overinflate what you think you can believe. Like you want to have realistic expectations, I guess, but try and push for the, the kind of the top end of those realistic expectations at least. Sure. Yeah. Uh, again, everyone thought sub four minute mile was impossible. And then he does it. And then like a handful of people do it within the next few months. It's just like, again, once you believe that something can be done, I think it just totally shifts your outcome, right? If you just don't believe it, you're just not going to put in as much work. Now, I don't know if that's conscious or unconscious, but you're just not going to do it. Right. So if you don't think you can win a bodybuilding show, are you going to try as hard as you probably could? If you're like, Hey man, like I got a real good shot of winning this. Well, you're going to train a lot harder. You're going to put all of your work into it don't think that well good luck and then you had uh also you talked about which i think is probably a lot of people will like is that kind of growth mindset versus a fixed mindset yeah. if you want to kind of expand on that a little bit i think growth mindset is really really important again it's just how you see things like are are, are your again let's give bodybuilding analogies because it's a crowd here do you believe that like you have fixed genetics or do you believe that you can put in a lot of work to change your outcomes? What are you going to do if you have a fixed mindset? Are you going to train that much? Are you going to train as hard? No, probably not. Cause you're going to be, Oh, why bother? You know, like so-and-so is stronger than me or Steve's got better quads than I do. Like I'm not going to go squat or something like that. It's just, 
if you believe that you can put in the work to change the outcomes, you're going to do it. It's, I think it's really that simple. Again, the growth mindset has a couple of things. You just, you're able to take more feedback. You want to sort of learn and improve. You know that you can always improve and grow, things like that. It's just really important. It's like, I think we've all kind of been in that, that mindset before where you just, you're not really sure or whatever, but is that just really the right route that you want to take? No, like you can change your outcome. So do it. I know a quote you had in there was like, even if life gives you lemons, you can still make lemonade through commitment and working hard and staying positive. And people often use kind of the, the card analogy of like, you you have to play with the cards you're dealt with. You can still win the card game if you're clever enough or good enough at playing with the cards you've got. And uh, it's kind of like, you, you can only con- control what you can control. Like you can't control what hand you've got, you've got that or genetics, whatever it is in like bodybuilding, but same with like business and everything. You can't control that you haven't got a huge amount of money and funding from your parents or something, but maybe you can go out there and kind of get a side job or side hustle or whatever, and you can start helping yourself. Uh, it, yeah, it comes back to that kind of trying to do everything you can and be proactive rather than just letting things kind of just happen to you and sitting back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, like a lot of this stuff is interrelated. If you have a growth mindset, you're going to be more hopeful. You're just going to take more action, which at the end of the day results in more work being done. And one of the the practical tip you had at the end there, which I really liked was kind of because it's something that I think a lot of people try and practice. And I did it for a little bit and then I kind of gave it up. But I feel, And I feel bad for it now because of seeing it. It was kind of a, almost like gratitude and like keeping a journal yeah. over at least three things that happen yeah. to you each day, like good things which, because that, I guess, breeds positivity. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of stuff that I looked into, a lot of reading that I did was in positive psychology. Uh, You know, Martin Seligman's kind of like the godfather of that. But you start reading all this, and there's a lot of research and stuff that backs it up. Where And actually, so there's, um, I think on uh, Corsia, there's the Yale University released, like, one of their most popular classes ever. It was all about happiness. And again, like, they did it this year because of of COVID. Like, they knew everyone needed it. And so one of the things you can do, again, you can, you can see the good in things or you can see the bad in things, right? So again, if you focus on the negative, oh, I'm stuck at home. I can't do this. I can't do this. That's not a good mindset. It's not a good approach to take. You choose to flip that around. You're like, hey, you know what? Boy, I'm thankful that, you know, I can still train from home. I'm thankful that, you know, hey, I've got you know, uh, I can get Amazon deliveries to my house, like whatever it is, right? I'm thankful that I can spend more time with my family. Like I have two small kids, like, boy, we're, we're basically joined at the hip. Let's yeah. just say that. And we have <laughs> been since March. So seven and a half months, like, do you see that as a good thing? Or do you see that as a bad thing? Again, I, I chose to saw it as a good thing. I was like, you know, I taught my daughter how to read, you know, all, all these things. And, um, I make them train jujitsu a couple times a week. Like I have them lifting once a week, like nothing crazy, of course, because they're six and eight. But it's like, again, that's just choosing the positive things versus focusing on the negative. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm perfect with this. You know, don't ever, you know, see that. It's really hard to do. And sometimes when really bad stuff happens, it's really hard not to go immediately to that negative. But again, you just have to kind of train yourself over time and kind of catch yourself doing that. If you catch yourself doing it, you can kind of start to flip that script a little bit. Yeah, I've definitely had that experience where like my immediate is negative, but I like I'm better and better now catching myself and kind of chilling out. Just I don't know, an easy example is, I don't know, like you miss your train or you're stuck in traffic or whatever it is. And like you get angry initially and then you're like, you just sit back and you're like, okay, let's just be calm. Let's just I don't know, I've got an audiobook here, I've got some emails I can read, whatever it is, and then you just you chill out. And that that's been really helpful for me at least, because I was always as a child, one of those kind of I just got like when that flip switched, I then was just set to just being an angry person. So it's allowed me to be a lot more stoic, I guess, in that sense. And yeah, the next yeah. the next chapter you oh yeah, I guess the next chapter or the next kind of uh one on the pyramid was discipline which I guess a lot of people listening to this when they think about dieting, especially for shows and stuff, they'll be able to relate to. I don't know if there's anything you want to dig out from, from discipline. Dieting is a perfect example, right? And this ties back to, we already talked about a little bit, delayed gratification. If you want to be successful, you have to be willing to give up some stuff in the short term, immediate gratification for the trade-off of long-term success. There's just, there's no way around it. Again, bodybuilding, Let's take an example. So 
you could kind of fall fall victim to the idea where you just got to take a crap ton of drugs because you want to get as big as possible as soon as possible. And a lot of people do that, right? And what happens? Their health outcomes shit the bed, right? We've seen that before in bodybuilding. You try to do all this stuff because you want to be the overnight success. And there are trade-offs involved in that. It's just not a good approach to take. If you take the more long-term approach, it's like you said, you know, take someone like John Meadows, right? He's been competing for 25 years or something like that. John Meadows is the man, you know, again, whatever, you know, he's probably not competing in natural divisions or whatever, but again, like he's at least done things the smart wrong, the smart right way over time to where, you know, he didn't really sacrifice his health. And, and again, you know, people listening are probably like, oh, he just had some stuff again. You're like, okay, okay, whatever. But like, Again, he had more of a long-term approach to it. And in bodybuilding, like, that's what it takes to be successful. You're just not going to grow a ton of muscle overnight. It doesn't happen. It doesn't, you know, unless you're mild set and deficient or whatever, like those cows. But you know, there's like two people in the world that have that. So are you one of those? No. Okay. So get back to training. I guess it's, it comes down to, uh, like you talked about that to-do list and having that, that allow that kind of gives you a guideline of this is discipline this is what i need to do today and i talk to my clients a lot about like ticking the boxes like you need to hit your macros do your training do your steps if you've done that don't stress about like anything else like now you've been productive you kind of move towards and i guess the same applies to business like it's actually and i guess you don't find it funny but i find it funny how much this parallels to fitness because you've written it so you probably realize how much of it parallels to kind of the fitness world but it's, actually when i look at a lot of fitness stuff i'm like oh yeah this is the same for business in many ways like many yeah. of these same traits just allow you to kind of keep moving towards things so um yeah i don't know if we probably don't want to dig into every chapter and kind of give the book away in a sense because uh yeah i mean there's there's so much more that we could delve into on those and what i really enjoyed when reading through it and as we kind of shown here is like a lot of the books i had listened to or read you kind of were picking bits of those and putting them in and actually that's how i almost felt with uh like we spoke off air so oh no i spoke it was on air scientific principle of strength training for me was just like whoa this is putting together all these textbooks i've read but into a construct a principled way of thinking and how i can apply this and so that's what i feel like your book will be doing for people in that it's putting all these kind of self-help books or whatever a variety of resources and putting it into a system where it's like oh now i can apply this within what I'm trying to do with my business or other goals, I guess you can apply this to as well. Like, is that where you were kind of going with it? Is that what you wanted it for, to be for people? Yeah, exactly. So business, fitness, diet training, overcoming obstacles, whatever it is, there are some, I don't know if, if human universals may be a good way to phrase it, but there are some general things that just overlap in, in all this stuff. And if you apply those, you will be more successful. Now we can't guarantee how successful, of course, because there's so many factors that go into it. But if you take all these key principles and you apply them, you will be more successful over time. There's just, you know, no, no, no real other way that I could say it that's any better than that. And again, yeah, it's just, that was the thing, and I've become obsessed with, you know, reading as much as I can and, you know, again, whatever it is, just because I like to see all the different parallels, but they all overlap, right? If you want to be successful in fitness or in business or in, you know, whatever it is, you're going to do these things. There's just, there's no better way around it. Um, real quick on the delayed gratification on the discipline front, think about personal finances. Think about personal finances. How do you become wealthy over time? Is it A, you, you know, take huge financial risk, at, you know, it's something that might have a huge return, but might be total, total bust. Okay, that's one option. And maybe that works every now and again. Or do you just like put it in something kind of slow and boring and it just builds slowly over time? Steve, what does that sound like? You build slowly over time. What does that sound like? It sounds exactly like bodybuilding. It sounds exactly like it. It's literally the same exact thing applies. You just, you don't necessarily have to do these super sexy things that, and again, we all fall victim to that because we all want stuff right now. We don't want to yeah. wait. We all want instant gratification. But if you take that, you are trading off things. But again, look at uh, Warren Buffett, right? Like he's the, the example of it. He didn't do anything fancy. 
you just slowly build over time. And then all of a sudden, because of the way things compound, he's like one of the richest people of all time. I think it's it's so well said. And actually, it's, it's funny because it makes me think of um, when I was interviewing Mike on the podcast and he just moved to Las Vegas. And I was like, so have you been doing any gambling out there? I, I feel like you probably aren't the type of guy that would gamble. And that's almost what you're kind of alluding to here, unless it's a safe bet. I mean, but like gambling... Uh, I mean, sure, you could risk it all on whatever it is on a throw and you could make your, your millions, but the chances aren't in your favor. The the deck cards are stacked against you. And I think maybe we see a few highlight reels of people who have been able to do that. But the majority of people like Renaissance Periodization have got to the point they are now because of all that underlying hard work and consistency and putting in all that effort and being positive has got you where you are today. So, um, yeah, I, I want to make sure people uh, have a kind of idea of how they can get this book. When's it out? Um, kind of, yeah, give your, I guess, well, we've kind of been selling it, but hopefully not in a, a sales pitchy kind of way. It's more of a, it, this is giving the information out to people. And I, I think a lot of the listeners will be interested. Yeah. So uh, November 17th, it'll be out. Um, it's going to be available on Amazon, so you can get a hard copy. Uh, you can also get the PDF, you can get the ebook version on the RP site. I will have that. Um, it's also going to have the Kindle option on Amazon. So it's going to have a few different options for people, whatever they want. Um, I, would, I would encourage people to check it out. Uh, you know, one funny thing that I'll maybe wrap up is I, I talked to Mike about this, and I was like, I was like, I was like hey, man, like, I don't. I'm worried like if some people read the book, they might say, there's nothing new here. Like that was, that was my main thing. And he says, he told me to read this book. Uh, and I put this on my Instagram a couple of weeks ago. It's like how to stop worrying and start living by Dale Carnegie. Right? It's like written in 1940 or something like that. Wow. He opens the book by saying, this is 1940. He starts it by saying, there's nothing new here in this book, but we all need a little kick or a little boost to get us going. This is 1940. This is we're 80 years later, right? And it's like, if you apply these basic principles that are the same, have been the same for like thousands of years, right? Because you start reading back in, you know, Greek and Roman stuff, like they were talking about some of this stuff. My God, it's not new, but sometimes it doesn't matter, right? Again, you'd look at RP, like we don't have any secrets. But again, if you apply the basic principles, you'll get success. Sometimes people just need that. You need an easy to read format of these basic things to give you a little kick. That's what this book is going to be. There's no secrets or shortcuts, but if you read it and actually apply it, you will have better outcomes. I love that. I think that's so well said because I think a lot of uh, like a lot of people listening will be competitors, but also a lot of them will be coaches personal trainers and i think a lot of us including myself and i'm sure you've had this nick it's like that imposter syndrome where you just feel like you're not saying anything new everyone's already said it but you could be repackaging it or saying it in a different way that just other people now they're like oh now i can take all this in kind of like i said the scientific principles of strength training maybe it wasn't saying anything necessarily completely new to me but it was in a way that i was just like now i understand it now i see through the matrix almost uh so yeah i i i think the book will probably do that for a lot of people and you'll be hopefully pleasantly surprised how kind of uh, positive people uh, take the feedback and very few say i've i've heard this all before <laughs> Yeah. Again, that was the thing. I just wanted to kind of take all these ideas that I had and, and notice all these things um, and just put them together in like a, an easy to understand format. And I mean, the, you know, the book's like 150 pages, so it's not going to be a super long read. <clears throat> you know, if you have a couple hours, you can read through it, make some notes and you're going to, you're going to be better off. I guess as well, it is one of those books that almost like your other RP books become almost like textbooks in a sense of you can come back to it to dig into bits and it can reignite that fire as such to kind of get you going again. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that to be released. Uh, and I'm sure the audience will be as well. I don't know if RP have anything else in the pipeline. If you, are you stirring up anything else or is there anything else you want to kind of let people know or how to reach you? I think a lot of people will be aware of, uh, Renaissance periodization by now, but yeah, just let people know. Yeah. Well, so again, thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, follow along RP, RP strength on Instagram. Um, you want to check me out. Uh, Nick.shaw.rp is my handle on there. But um, I mean, those are the best spots uh, in terms of other things that we have coming up. 
and we just released a new app update that's it's, it's pretty big man it has a lot of cool things uh you know we took some of the feedback that we were getting um so it now incorporates night shift you can move you know you you have more meal flexibility in terms of the number of meals per day which is pretty cool so if you're awake longer you can go like all the way up to eight meals you know if you have some shorter days where maybe you sleep in or something like that and um, you can do fewer meals per day so again before it was four to six those were the only options now Again, it depends a little bit on how long you're awake, so it doesn't give all these options, but you can go two through eight now in terms of meal frequency. Now, again, it depends on how long you're awake. Um, also, the other cool thing, so I won't go on too much. About That's all right. Because you know, um, before, it wouldn't preview your macro adjustments in the week. It would just be like, hey, you need to make this adjustment. Do you want to do it? And you would click yes, and it would make it for you. Now you can preview that. So you can know exactly what the app is going to do. And that way, you know, you can either approve it or you can be like, oh, whoa, hey, oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't actually want to cut that many carbs, bro. Um, the other really cool thing that it does is it gives you the option to do small, medium, and large updates in your weekly review. So if like, oh, and you, again, you can preview them. So again, you can kind of look at it and think, oh, well, you know what? Let's say I was at 150 grams of carbs. Uh, well, if I choose small, it's going to take me down to a 110, let's say. What if I go... The, the really big ones is going to take me down to like 50. Okay, I don't want to go down to 50, let's be honest. So you can choose in the middle. So it's very much, it's about as close as we can make it to a coach where you have more options, you have more freedom. And it goes back to internal locus of control. If you want to get back to that, right? It gives you a little more autonomy. I like that. I think the, the more flexibility you can give within uh, kind of bounds of their goals uh, is only a good thing which again a good coach will do so that sounds really cool uh, i'll make sure that's all linked below so people can get hold of those and yeah thank you so much for coming on nick i'm glad i mean it feels crazy to have known you for so long and only just actually spoken uh so yeah, yeah it's been a pleasure <laughs> cool again thanks so much for having me on and uh, thanks for having mike on uh you know thanks for putting up with him as much as you do <laughs> don't worry he must be the favorite guest on the podcast i i i I think looking at the the numbers of views and everything, people can't get enough of Mike. So uh, yeah, they haven't they haven't got bored of him quite yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, thanks, man. We appreciate it. Cheers, guys, for listening, and we'll catch you soon. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.